Elias, your services are no longer required. Those words hung in the air like a death knell, each syllable piercing my heart. I stared back at Dean Franklin in disbelief, my mouth agape. All the years of hard work, the countless students whose lives I had impacted, the sacrifices made, it all amounted to this unceremonious dismissal. But, I don't understand. What did I do wrong? I stammered, desperate for an explanation that never came. Franklin's expression remained stoic, thus betraying no hint of remorse. That's my final decision. You have until the end of the week to clear out your office. As he turned to leave, I caught a glimpse of Randall hovering outside, a sickening smirk plastered across his face. That weasel Randall, my so-called colleague who had schemed and undermined me at every turn. I should have seen this coming. The days that followed were a numbing blur, packing up the remnants of a career that now seemed like a mirage. I found myself adrift, a casualty of political gamesmetry and jealous agendas that I had been naive enough to overlook. It was Marlon who pulled me out of that abyss, just as he had so many times before. My oldest friend since our days roaming the streets of Philly. One look at my disheveled state and he instantly knew something was off. My man, what's eating you? You look like you just got kicked in the gut. I couldn't even muster a response, letting the cardboard boxes strewn across my living room speak for themselves. Marlon's eyes widened as the realization dawned. No way, E. They didn't. I gave a solemn nod, fighting back the tears that threatened to spill over. Marlon didn't utter another word, he just pulled me into a tight embrace, a sanctuary of comfort amidst the turmoil. When we finally parted, a newfound determination burned in his eyes. Listen up, E. This ain't over, you hear me? We're gonna sort this mess out and get you back on your feet. His words resonated like a battle cry, reigniting the flame of hope that had nearly been extinguished. Marlon then revealed his plan, a chance encounter that would set me on a path I never could have imagined, a journey of redemption and self-discovery that would test my very resilience. Little did I know, it was just the beginning. A week had crawled by in a haze of self-pity and despair when Marlon showed up unannounced at my doorstep. His booming voice snapped me out of my stupor. Yo E, enough moping around. Time to get your ass in gear. I opened my mouth to protest, but Marlon held up a hand. Don't even try arguing with me, man. I got something that'll put that fire back in your eyes. Curiosity peaked despite my sullen mood. I obliged and followed him out to his car. The drive was silent until we pulled up outside a nondescript building in downtown Philly. Where are we? I asked, bewildered. Marlon flashed a mischievous grin. You'll see. We entered through a side door and climbed a dimly lit stairwell. At the top, Marlon paused dramatically before swinging open the door to reveal a spacious room buzzing with activity. Men and women of all ages sat around tables, engaged in discussions and poring over books and tablets. What is this place? I whispered, in awe of the scene unfolding before me. This is my cousin Zara's pride and joy, Marlon said with unmistakable fondness, the Lighthouse Adult Education Center. As if on cue, a striking woman in her mid-thirties materialized beside us. She extended a warm hand towards me. You must be Elias. Marlon has told me so much about you. There was a raw magnetism about Zara, an intensity that commanded respect. I immediately felt at ease in her presence. Zara here is working miracles with this place, Marlon continued, helping folks who, who slip through the cracks get a quality education, free of charge. Zara waved off the praise modestly. It's not just about education, it's about empowerment, about giving people the tools to transform their lives. She turned her piercing gaze on me. And from what I hear, you could be exactly the catalyst we need to take this to even greater heights. I must have looked skeptical because Zara let out a hearty laugh. Oh, don't sell yourself short, Elias. Marlon told me all about how you were railroaded out of that teaching gig at the college, Sounds like those corporate vultures couldn't handle an educator with real passion for his craft. Her words struck a nerve, stirring something inside me that had been dormant for far too long. Zara sensed the shift and pounced. We could use a man like you to spearhead our new accelerated degree program. What do you say, Elias? Ready to show those pencil pushers what real teaching looks like? I glanced over at Marlon, who was grinning like a proud parent. In that moment, I felt the shackles of defeat dissolve. A new fire, 
a new purpose burned within me. Without hesitation, I extended my hand to seal the deal. Let's do this. Fired up by Zara's proposition, I dove headfirst into planning the accelerated degree program. But reality hit hard when we struggled to secure funding and support from the community. This is a critical time, Elias, Zara cautioned during one of our planning sessions. We need to generate excitement, prove that this program can make a real difference. I nodded resolutely. Just point me in the right direction. I'm ready to go to bat for this. Zara's eyes narrowed. Well, for starters, we may have to wrestle with some skeptics. She slid a printout across the table. My heart sank as I scanned the headline. Former college prof a liability? Opponents raise concerns over accelerated degree program. There, plain as day, was a quote from none other than Randall smearing my reputation. Says here your termination involved unethical conduct that makes you unfit to lead educational initiatives, Zara said, her voice dripping with disdain. White-hot rage consumed me. Of course that weasel would try to sabotage my comeback. That depraved piece of garbage I seethed through gritted teeth. He's the one who orchestrated this entire smear campaign. Zara held up a calming hand. I believe you, Elias, but we can't afford to get mired in mudslinging right now. The high road is our only play. As much as I wanted to confront Randall and expose his lies, I knew she was right. This program was bigger than my personal vendetta. Over the next few months, I channeled every ounce of my energy into promoting the accelerated degree. From community outreach events to one-on-one -on -one meetings, I became a man possessed, determined to drown out the naysayers with the sheer force of my conviction. It wasn't easy. Randall's poisonous allegations had taken root, sowing doubts that weren't so easily dispelled. We struggled to attract students, donors shying away from the controversy, but I refused to be deterred. If anything, the resistance only fanned the flames of my passion. The breakthrough came when a young man named Marcus joined the first pilot cohort, a high school dropout who had fallen into petty crime, desperately seeking a reprieve. His transformation was astonishing to witness. Within months, Marcus was devouring course material, actively participating in discussions, and mentoring his younger peers. When a local TV station caught wind of his story, they jumped at the chance to showcase the program's impact. Suddenly, the tide began to turn. More students enlisted from all walks of life. A struggling single mother yearning for a stable career path. A disillusioned office worker seeking higher purpose. Each new addition reinforced the program's ability to profoundly change lives. As the newsworthy stories piled up, Randall's vitriol was effectively neutralized, his words drowned out by a growing swell of public support. The smarmy worm may have slithered away, but I savored a small victory. Checkmate, you repulsive snake. Your king is running out of moves. With each student's success story, the accelerated degree program gained momentum. My initial skeptics were being converted into ardent supporters, their doubts erased by the tangible impact we were achieving. None of it would have been possible without Zara's tireless efforts and unwavering belief in our mission. Her ability to connect with students from all backgrounds was truly remarkable. The key is meeting them where they're at. She explained one evening as we prepped for an upcoming seminar. No judgment, just an openness to understand their struggles and aspirations. I nodded, making a mental note. Zara's approach was a masterclass in empathy that I strived to emulate. As word spread, our enrollment numbers swelled. The diverse array of faces in our classrooms was a point of pride, a true reflection of the vibrant tapestry that is Philadelphia. There was John, a grizzled ex-con who had spent half his life behind bars. Determined to make good on his second chance, he attacked his studies with a fervor that inspired everyone around him. Then there was Maria, a single mom working double shifts at a diner just to keep a roof over her kids' heads. Her story of perseverance in the face of adversity moved us all to tears. Each pupil's journey was a poignant reminder of why we toiled relentlessly to make this program a success. Their hardships, their unbreakable spirits, these were the driving forces that kept us pushing forward. Of course, no forward march is without its potholes. Randall, that wretched snake, continued slithering around in the shadows, sowing seeds of dissent whenever he could slink his way into a public forum. A noble effort, but severely misguided, 
he would proclaim with that signature smug sneer. Allowing one bad apple to facilitate such initiatives puts the integrity of the entire system at risk. The accusations nagged at me like a persistent toothache, threatening to unstitch the very fabric we had so carefully woven. I could only grip my teeth and keep charging ahead, tempering my fury with determination. My moment to confront Randall directly came during a particularly heated town hall meeting. He had just delivered another diatribe when I shot up from my seat, unable to contain my outrage any longer. That's enough blatant libel from you, Randall. I shouted over the hushed murmurings, all eyes swiveling towards me. We're doing real meaningful work to uplift this community, work that you clearly cannot begin to comprehend. Randall's sneer morphed into a look of stunned disbelief as I continued unleashing years' worth of pent-up grievances. With each biting remark, I could see him withering before the crowd's judgmental glares. When I was finally spent, Randall opened and closed his mouth wordlessly a broken marionette with its strings cut. He slunk away in disgrace, his smear campaign utterly deflated by the truth. As I retook my seat, met by nods of affirmation and pride from my colleagues, the weight of years of oppression finally lifted from my shoulders. Zara leaned over, squeezing my hand with a radiant smile. That's how you slay a dragon. For the first time in a long time, I felt truly invincible. After my fiery confrontation with Randall, a palpable shift occurred. It was as if the community had collectively awoken from his manipulative spell, clearly seeing the accelerated degree program for the force of good it truly was. Enrollment skyrocketed. Local businesses clamored to be associated with our mission, offering internships and job placement opportunities. High-profile philanthropists sought us out, eager to throw their considerable wealth behind our cause. Through it all, Randall remained conspicuously absent, a specter that no longer haunted our waking thoughts. I relished in our hard-won victory, a testament to perseverance overpowering petty saboteurs. Then, one fateful afternoon, Zara burst into my office, eyes wild, chest heaving. Elias, you're not gonna believe this, she panted, struggling to catch her breath. I set down my pen, concern etching my features. What is it? What's wrong? Zara shook her head vehemently. Nothing's wrong. Everything's absolutely right. A grin spread across her face. We just got the Ellison Grant. My jaw dropped. The Ellison Grant, one of the largest educational endowments in the country. A windfall that would secure the program's future for years to come. How? I sputtered, dumbfounded. Apparently Marcus's story struck a particular chord with the board members. Zara explained, still buzzing with excitement. They were so inspired by his transformation, they fast-tracked our application. She threw her arms around me in a jubilant embrace. In that moment, everything we had persevered through, the smear campaigns, the uphill battles for funds and support, it all felt utterly insignificant. We had ascended to rarefied air. Word travels fast in our tight-knit community. Before long, news of the Ellison Grant swept through the streets like a tidal wave of hope and elation. Families who once viewed higher education as an impossible dream now dared to envision their children walking across a commencement stage made possible by our tuition assistance programs. During this whirlwind of celebration, an unlikely messenger arrived at the center's doorstep. None other than Dean Franklin himself, the man who had so unceremoniously discarded me years prior. The optics of his visit were not lost on me as I descended the stairs to greet him, a dozen pairs of eyes tracking my every move. Franklin's expression was one of sheepish contrition as he extended a clammy hand. Elias, I can't begin to convey how impressed I am by what you've accomplished here. I allowed the words to linger, refusing to grant him the satisfaction of a response. Not yet. Seemingly flustered by my silence, Franklin pressed on. Which is why I'm here today to formally offer you reinstatement at the college, a tenured position, the works. The words hung in the air like a bad odor. Reflexively my gaze cut towards Zara and the others who had become a surrogate family in the wake of my unceremonious ousting. The hurt was still palpable. Drawing himself up to his full height, Franklin delivered his final appeal. We were wrong, Elias. Wrong to let someone of your caliber slip through the cracks based on slanderous allegations. I'm hoping you'll consider giving us a second chance to atone for our grave transgression. At last, I spoke. 
my voice steady, resolute. Tell me, Franklin, does this invitation extend to the others standing before you, the marginalized masses your institution has systematically turned a blind eye towards? Franklin opened his mouth, then promptly closed it, his rebuttal caught like a barb in his throat. I didn't think so, I said, holding his wavering gaze. Which is why, with all due respect, I must decline your offer. My purpose lies here, empowering those your system has failed. Until you appreciate what true equitable education embodies, we have nothing further to discuss. With that, I turned on my heel and strode back up the stairs, met with raucous cheers and applause. Zara swept me into her embrace once more, eyes brimming with proud tears. You humble me every single day, she whispered fiercely. Her words, laden with hard-earned validation, rendered me speechless. Because in that moment, shackled no longer by guilt or self-doubt, I realized my true purpose had finally found me. The Ellison Grant ushered in a new era of growth and opportunity for the accelerated degree program. Suddenly, financial constraints were a thing of the past, replaced by an abundance of resources to expand our reach and impact. This is just the beginning, Elias, Zara proclaimed, barely containing her giddiness as we poured over blueprints for new campuses. Can you imagine the possibilities before us? I could, and the visions were exhilarating. State-of-the-art facilities, cutting-edge technology, a rich curriculum tailored to the needs of our unique student body. No lofty ambition seemed unattainable with the Ellison's incredible generosity. As our expansion plans took shape, the news traveled fast, catapulting our modest initiative into the national spotlight. Magazine profiles lauded our innovative approach to adult education. Philanthropists and education reformers beat a path to our door, clamoring to study our blueprint for success. Amidst the whirlwind of attention, a tinge of irony failed to escape me. The very establishment that had once spurned me was now tentatively extending an olive branch. Or perhaps more accurately, grasping at any remaining shreds of relevance. It came in the form of a crisp, embossed letter from the university provost, an explicit me culpa for my wrongful termination years prior, and an offer to rejoin their ranks as a tenured professor. Extraordinary feats call for reasonable reconsiderations, the letter stated in that trademark sterile academic jargon. We humbly entreat you to lend your pioneering expertise to our hallowed institution once more. I couldn't help but scoff at the Orwellian audacity of it all. The fact that this overture arrived only after I had ascended to national prominence was a truth too glaring to ignore. Had our program floundered in obscurity, I'd have remained a scorned heretic in their dogmatic eyes. Yet as self-serving as their offer reeked, a part of me couldn't dismiss it outright. Here was a chance to enact real change from within the archaic system, to disrupt the status quo on a macro scale. I ruminated over the proposition for several days until Zara, ever intuitive, sensed the conflict brewing inside me. Don't even think about it, E, she said firmly, fixing me with a pointed stare. Those elitist vultures are just hoping to co-opt your success to mask their own obsolescence. I opened my mouth to protest, but Zara barreled on. We're so much more than just an education initiative, Elias. We're a movement, a revolution, that's redefining what access and inclusivity truly mean. Why would you ever want to compromise that just to be another cog in their self-serving machine? Her words struck a resonant chord deep within me. Zara was right. I had shed my shackles and discovered a higher calling. To backslide into the insular ivory towers I once inhabited would be an unforgivable betrayal of the profound impact we were achieving. Without a shred of hesitation, I penned my unequivocal rebuttal. I must respectfully decline your offer to return. My destiny lies not in perpetuating your antiquated systems of exclusion, but rather in dismantling them from the outside through empowerment and equitable education for all. With a satisfied grin, I slipped the letter into the outgoing mail, closing that chapter of my past once and for all. The sheer catharsis was indescribable, the severing of anchors that had bound me for far too long. No more apologies, no more appeals for validation from the elite arbiters I had sworn off. My life's work had transcended their ivory towers, forging a new frontier of impact and purpose, and I had never felt more alive. With the university's overture firmly dismissed, I found myself at a crossroads. On one path, 
lay the alluring prospect of nationwide expansion, replicating our model of success across the country, blazing new trails of empowerment and inclusivity. The other path, murkier yet tantalizing, hinted at an opportunity to enact sweeping reform from within the increasingly antiquated confines of traditional academia. As the internal tug of war raged, Zara sensed my preoccupation. We were enjoying a rare moment of quiet after another marathon planning session when she broached the subject. You've been awfully pensive lately, she ventured, fixing me with that trademark perceptive gaze. What's weighing on that brilliant mind of yours? I exhaled deeply, steeling myself to unveil the thoughts that had been percolating. I can't shake this nagging sense that we're just treating the symptoms, not the root cause. Zara arched an inquisitive eyebrow, silently urging me to elaborate. Don't get me wrong, the work we're doing is vital, life-changing even. But at the end of the day, we're still operating outside the traditional higher education sphere, offering a parallel path when so many are still trapped on the archaic conveyor belt. Understanding dawned across Zara's features as my meaning became clear. With a resigned sigh, she nodded slowly. You're thinking about that university offer, aren't you? About trying to overhaul the whole damn system from the inside out. It wasn't a question, but an astute observation that gave voice to the warring perspectives jockeying for dominance in my psyche. I held Zara's gaze, searching for any trace of judgment, but found only empathy. You know I'll support whatever path you choose, she said, squeezing my hand reassuringly. You've more than proven your worth, E. Earned the right to shape the battlefield on your own terms. Just don't lose sight of why we started this in the first place. Her words resonated profoundly, dredging up memories of those first harrowing days coalescing the program from scratch. The triumph of perseverance over daunting obstacles. Suddenly, my path forward crystallized with galvanizing clarity. You're right, Z, I said resolutely. This was never about assimilating into a broken system, but forging a new paradigm entirely, one that opens doors instead of erecting barriers. Zara's features blossomed with a proud smile as the gravity of my declaration sank in. With a renewed sense of conviction, I outlined my vision for expanding our award-winning model nationwide, a grassroots juggernaut fueled by empowerment, not institutional red tape. Over the ensuing weeks, the wheels were set in motion. We identified underserved urban communities across the state of Pennsylvania as beachheads for our first wave of expansion. Recruitment efforts intensified as we scoured for passionate educators and mentors cut from the same empathetic cloth as Zara. My personal journey had been one of reclamation, shedding the shackles of outdated norms to embrace a higher calling. In leading this growing movement, I vowed to impart that same sense of liberation to all who joined our ranks. No longer would the disenfranchised be compelled to conform to a one-size-fits-all system of higher learning. We would be the architects of a bold new frontier, one where every member of society could harness the transformative power of knowledge on their own terms. As our operations swelled with a fresh influx of true believers, I couldn't help but revel in the beautifully chaotic pandemonium of it all. This was the dream, fully actualized. A multi-front war waged not just against ignorance and inequity, but the oppressive archaic norms that perpetuated them. At the eye of this perfectly choreographed storm stood Zara, radiating with purpose. When our eyes met amidst the hurricane of activity, she flashed me a look of pure vindication, a silent affirmation that surrendering was never an option. This was our path, our true manifest destiny, and we would stop at nothing until the entire world felt its seismic impact. The grand opening of our first expansion site was a momentous occasion that still gives me goosebumps. Zara and I stood side by side, surveying the state-of-the-art classrooms buzzing with fresh-faced students from all walks of life. Can you believe this is just the beginning? She murmured, awestruck. I could barely find the words to capture the surreal enormity of it all. What had started as an audacious dream to uplift the marginalized was blossoming into a full-fledged nationwide movement. Over the ensuing months, our growth trajectory continued its meteoric ascent. New campuses sprouted up across Pennsylvania, then radiated outward in an ever-expanding radius of impact. The accelerated degree model resonated profoundly in underserved communities yearning for equitable access to higher education. 
With each groundbreaking ceremony and fresh crop of graduates, I felt the weight of vindication compounding upon my shoulders. This was more than just in program. It was a revolution, upending the antiquated power structures and socioeconomic barriers that had long stifled human potential. Even our staunchest detractors, the once scathing voices of dissent like Randall, were reduced to deafening silence in the face of our tsunami momentum. The cold, hard metrics of our outcomes simply could not be refuted or undercut by petty character assassinations. During those giddy days of rapid expansion, a familiar face from my past resurfaced, Dean Franklin. He had clearly gotten wind of our proliferation and seemed intent on extending an olive branch, however disingenuously. Elias, I have to commend you on the incredible strides you've made, he proclaimed with an overly saccharine tone during an impromptu visit. Your initiative has sparked quite the philosophical awakening across academia. I eyed him warily, instantly recognizing his placating doublespeak from our previous encounters. Franklin was clearly angling to co-opt our hard-won success, to retroactively align himself with the prevailing tide. Cut the crap, Franklin, I snapped, causing him to flinch. We both know this olive branch is just damage control, a desperate bid to remain relevant as your crumbling empire of elitism gets swept aside. To his credit, Franklin didn't attempt to deny the accusation. A rueful grimace played across his features as he slumped in resignation. You're right, of course. I'd be lying if I said our institution's dogmatic philosophies didn't require re-examination in light of your program's undeniable impact. He paused, seeming to carefully weigh his next words. Which is why I'm proposing ad attente, a chance to bury the hatchet and work in concert to usher in meaningful education reform from the inside out. I opened my mouth to deliver a curt rebuttal, but Franklin raised a hand to stop me. I'm not naive enough to think a few token gestures will absolve decades of systemic disparities and injustices, but I am pragmatic enough to recognize a paradigm shift when it's staring me in the face. Your life's work has irrevocably altered the landscape, Elias. All that's left is to decide how we move forward, as reluctant adversaries perpetuating the status quo or partners in catalyzing lasting, sustainable progress for all. His words gave me pause, compelling me to truly consider the implications of a potential alliance, even one forged from desperation. My eyes flitted toward Zara, whose measured expression revealed she had been weighing similar thoughts. Suddenly, her features settled into a resolved calm as she gave me the faintest of nods an imperceptible signal that she trusted my judgment in navigating these admittedly murky waters, whatever path I chose. Turning back towards Franklin, I felt a renewal of conviction gradually taking root, one that transcended my initial venom towards the institutions that had once spurned me. You're right, the hardliner's days are numbered, I stated flatly. But real, lasting reform demands pragmatism over petty grudges, we have a real opportunity here to break down insidious barriers and rewrite the rules from the ground up. Franklin's eyes widened, hopefully, but I raised a solitary finger to halt his premature gratitude. However, let me be unequivocally clear. This is not a concession or a white flag we're extending. Our program's philosophies and methods will remain at the forefront, period. You'd be wise to accept that as the bedrock condition moving forward. After a tense pause, Franklin gave a resolute nod of understanding. Your terms are acknowledged, Elias. Now, shall we get to work forging a more equitable future for all? As I clasped his proffered hand, sealing the uneasy alliance, I couldn't help but glance back at the throngs of students diligently assembled in our classrooms, the lifeblood fueling this seismic revolution. They were the true vanguards, the unwavering light piercing through generations of institutionalized darkness and despair. In building this ever-expanding vanguard of changemakers, I had become an architect of something far greater than I ever could have envisioned. It was the dawn of a new age, one where passion, perseverance, and an unwavering belief in human potential would reign supreme over dogma and inequality. And as I surveyed the beaming pride radiating from Zara's eyes, I knew our march had only just begun.